Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explained. Now ARM has announced a whole bunch of new GPU and CPU designs. This is one of two videos looking at the new announcement. In this video, we're gonna cover the new CPU designs. That's the Cortex-X3, the Cortex-A715 and the refresh of the Cortex-A510. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so ARM has been following the same cadence as it has in other years. Around about this time of the year announces the new CPU and GPU designs, and then we see those turn up in smartphones in the early part of 2023. So specifically we're looking at the Cortex X3, the Cortex A715 and the refresh of the A510. So let's start with the X3. Okay, so the Cortex X program is designed to have a high performance CPU core that kind of pushes the performance envelope and doesn't worry quite so much about the efficiency. And as a result, you would see one core, except for Google who put in two, but one X core uh, in a processor. And then you'd see that supported by seven other cores in the A range. And this really helps when you want to get that single threaded performance up. And that affects applications that don't have multiple threads happening, don't send out different jobs to the different uh, CPUs. They just want to get one thing done, does it serially, and it wants to get it done as quick as possible. That's where you see the performance benefit of the X core. Now the Cortex X3, of course, follow us from the X2 and the X1. And when it comes to the X2, we've seen that in processors from Qualcomm, from Samsung, and from MediaTek. And I'm expecting to see, again, processors from Qualcomm and Samsung and MediaTek, all with the Cortex X3 in them. When it comes to Google's new processor, the Tensor 2 that it may announce later in the year, that's probably gonna be back onto the Cortex X2 because of the way the cadence is done. They're kind of a bit behind uh, everybody else. But Cortex X3, certainly something we're gonna see in the flagship devices from Samsung and from OnePlus and Vivo and Oppo and all that uh, in the early part of 2023. So looking at how the CPU fits into the overall system, here you can see a rough idea of what we may see in some flagship processors for next year. You've got one Cortex X3 core, probably three Cortex A715 cores, then four Cortex A510 cores, and then the new GPU, which I'm covering in the other video, the Immortalis G715. And ARM say that when you use this as a total solution, they're calling it their total compute solution, then you're going to see an average of a 28% uplift in in performance that's across CPU and GPU with a power reduction of 16% and less uh, hammering of the RAM so it's 23% DRAM traffic uh, reduction of course that's important because accessing the RAM uh, costs energy and also it does slow things down and again, we can see here this uh, total compute solution. That's the CPU and the GPU. And one thing to note now is that you are actually able to use up to 12 cores inside of the processor. So up until now, it's been eight, and now you can support 12. Whether we're gonna see 12 cores uh, or 10 cores in the upcoming set of flags is really interesting to see. But there's certainly room here for expansion. And also, of course, this could be applied to also Chromebooks and to Windows on ARM laptops, because maybe you could add in some extra cores to boost up the overall performance. So here are the big numbers for us. When we come to the Cortex-X3, we're looking at 25% peak performance increase and that's compared to an x2 smartphone and there may be changes here in the uh, clock frequencies as well to get that and then when it comes to the Cortex a715 the big point is is that it is 20 percent more power efficient compared to the Cortex a710 and that will be important when you're balancing the cores inside of the soc so that you've got the x3 can push out that performance but the uh, a715 can bring you that real uh, better power efficiency but while maintaining a high performance and then the refresh of the a510 uh, the way they've rejigged it they've looked at it all and they've reworked it and you can now get a five percent power reduction and of course you can now scale up to 12 cores as i mentioned a moment ago so looking specifically at the x3 here are some big numbers for us 
25% performance increase compared to uh, Android flagships of today. And to do that, that means you're going to have to have a Cortex-X3 running at 3.3 gigahertz with a 1 meg L2 cache and 8 megabytes of L3 cache. And so that will then give you a better performance compared to the smartphones of this year. And then here's a really, really interesting number. I don't know whether this even deserves its own video. 34% versus the latest mainstream laptop. Well, that's apparently against the Intel i7-1260P, which of course is a hybrid processor in the sense that it has uh, big cores and little cores, something that's quite new, relatively new for the way Intel are doing things. And they're saying when you look at a, a one particular benchmark, which is a specint uh, benchmark, then actually the X Cortex X3 can give you better performance than this Intel processor for laptops. Now, when you boil it all down, when you think about process nodes, five nanometer, four nanometer, when you talk about clock frequencies, when you talk about what is the actual number, how is the X3 better if you're running at the same clock speed, if you're running it at the same uh, kind of process, well, here's the number, 11% IPC, that's instructions per cycle uh, uplift. So basically, the X3 is 11% better than the X2 when you strip away all the changes that can happen due to caching and clock frequency and process node and all the other stuff. If you had an exactly an X2 and exactly an X3 in exactly the same conditions, the X3 is 11% faster. And if you apply that same equation to the Cortex A715, we find out here that it is a 5% faster than the Cortex A710 and 20% more power efficient. So that is a significant improvement, not double digit, but still 5% and better power efficiency. And as I said, there is also a refresh of the Cortex A510. What that basically means, they've worked out a better way to lay out the transistors, they've better way out the layout the design so that it actually performs a bit better. And in doing that, it actually makes it 5% more power efficient. And that does actually give you some wiggle room to bump up the clock frequencies. So maybe up until now we've kind of been used to 1.8 gigahertz. Maybe we're going to see some slightly faster uh, Cortex A510s in there. Now, of course, how you put these all together in a cluster is important. If we look at a X2 based system here with one plus three plus four, we can see, let's call that one X, that's our baseline. If you go to a one plus three plus four, call it X3 with a call it A715, then we're looking at that 12% overall boost in performance. Now, of course, you can jiggle these around. You could have a one plus four plus four. That, of course, is possible because now we can support up to 12 CPU goals. That will give you a 21% increase in performance. And a lot of that comes from the fact you've added another core. So you've gone from eight cores to, to nine cores. Or you could use a two plus two plus four. That's something that kind of uh, Google have been playing with in their tensors. And that would see you a 23% increase in performance because now you've got two Cortex-X cores. And then kind of a one out here for the far, far out. Maybe this is something that could happen in a laptop or in a Chromebook, something with better thermals than uh, than just a normal sort of smartphone. And that's eight Cortex-X3 cores and then four Cortex-A715s and then no Cortex A510. So you're really pushing out here. Thermally unconstrained is the technical word. And that's going to be 120% faster than uh, the kind of smartphones of today. And of course it is because you've got one Cortex X2 in today's smartphone and then you've got eight Cortex X3s in this new one. Of course it's going to be way, way, way faster. But that does show you the potential, certainly for uh, devices bigger than smartphones, where we could actually see more Cortex X cores put together uh, or, you know, into a processor. Okay, let's have a look quickly at the micro architecture. That means the design, how they've actually made these uh, designs for the Cortex X3 and then also for the Cortex A715 to see what improvements they've done internally to give us this 11% uh, boost uh, IPC ISO process so that the X3 is better than the X2. How did they do that? So if you look here on the right hand side, you can see that a processor basically has three parts, a beginning, a middle and an end. We could almost say the front end is responsible for getting the instructions. It also uses branch prediction to make sure it's getting the right instructions. And then once they're sent down the pipeline, they start to get decoded and then they get scheduled so that they can actually uh, finally finish the instructions, actually, you know, do the thing the instruction is meant to do. And that happens in the back end. And this is also where the data prefetching 
allows the uh, L1 and L2 core to be full ready for the things that are needed for the next set of instructions that come around in the pipeline. Now the Cortex X3 has been changing everything in the front end, the middle and the back end so that you get these uh, steady improvements across the whole processor. Now, a lot of the work that ARM has done in the front end is enlarging the capacities of the BTB, and that's the branch taken buffer, so it can have a more effective uh, understanding of the branching that's going to happen, and then making sure that the L1 cache actually has the stuff it needs into it. Because when you try to process a branch, of course, what's happening is the CPU is coming on, it says, compare this to three, for example, and it says, if it's not three, then you need to go off and do that lot of code. If it is three, you need to do that lot of code. This is a very simple example. Now, by looking ahead of what's going on, there's some very clever technologies that say, actually, we reckon it's gonna be this path. So let's get this path set up ready to go down the pipeline. If it gets it wrong, then there's what there's called a bubble because suddenly everything has to stop. Whoa, these are the wrong instructions. Get rid of them all. Go and go and get that instructions. You're way too, you're behind the game now, go on. And this forms a little bubble, like an air bubble in the pipe where they have to wait for everything to come. Now, if you can reduce those bubbles, even get rid of them by accurately having better branch predictors and increasing this uh, table, this uh, branch taken buffer, then you can actually make sure you've got the right instructions coming up the other end. In other words, the quicker you can get the instructions into the processor, then the quicker it can execute them. If you have a stall in getting them into the processor, then it can't execute them. Doesn't matter how many gigahertz you're running at, doesn't matter how well you're caching, is if there's no instructions to run, it can't do anything. So they've really, really spent a lot of time in making sure that the branch prediction and the, and the caching really that goes with that branch prediction has been improved to make sure you can get the instructions in there as fast as possible. Now, another area where they've improved the branch predictor is what they call indirect jumps. Normally in a computer program, it will go down and it will say branch if this number is not zero and then there's an address, uh, AB7125, whatever. It just says jump off to that address. And now the branch predictor has already looked what's over at that address, maybe started fetching some of it, getting it all ready to go into the pipeline. But sometimes you can say branch to whatever the address that you find in register one. This is what's called an indirect branch. It's not actually written there explicitly where to branch to. It's saying branch to whatever is in uh, register one. So you have to now know what's in register one when you're applying all these technologies about the branch predictor. And in this particular case, in the Cortex-3, they've really improved uh, conditional uh, indirect branches on the, on, on the register and made sure that they could again reduce the bubbles and make that prediction better. So you can see here in the summary, it's all about the uh, prefetching, the bubbles, the branching, the indirect branching, and making sure that those are all better so the instructions can get in to the CPU. Now, when you come to the middle part, of course, the Cortex X3 is an out of order core. That means it doesn't necessarily execute the instructions in the order that they were in the program. And the reason for that is, is that it knows that this add instruction between these two registers is not going to affect this other thing by getting something from memory. They can be done in parallel. And this is where you get instruction level parallelism. Okay, and here they've increased the decode width from five to six. They've increased the ALUs and they have a larger out of order window size, uh, in fact, up to 320 instructions there. And of course, the out of order instruction size is basically how far ahead is it looking to see what it can do instructions together so that they don't uh, they can be executed in parallel. And the further the window, the bigger the section of code you can look at, the more chance you have picking out things and say, let's execute these in parallel. But of course, the more complicated it is because you've got to keep a track of all those uh, instructions and work out what's going on. So in the middle core there, they've really improved how the out of order sequencing and how they can handle all of that, including the width of the process, the width of the pipe, uh, so it can handle things in parallel, more things in parallel. And in the back end, there have been several different changes, and one of them is how they are dealing with the caching. Now, of course, remember with caches, the idea is, is that you fetch something into the memory knowing you're going to use it, but at some point the cache becomes full. So there the question is, what do you do? How do you replace the entries that are already there? And they've made improvements in that, including the idea that you can actually evict something from one level of cache, but actually it's still in another level of cache. It's not gone completely. It kind of, it's readily available, but just at the next level of cache up. And again, they've done all the improvements so that at the front, the middle and the end, 
everything is tuned to make these instructions go as fast as possible through the pipeline and actually executed. And here we can see some charts using different benchmarks. So it looks like Geekbench 5, this is the kind of numbers that people are going to talk about when they start reviewing smartphones in 2023. You can see that 10% increase there. We're going to see in Geekbench 5, 11% if you're using Specint Base 2006. And then just under that, when you're looking at Spec Rate 2017. So basically, again, if you've got the X2 and the X3, same frequency, same amount of L2, same amount of L3, and all that kind of stuff, basically Geekbench is going to give you a 10% better number for the single threaded uh, applic for the single threaded benchmark. So let's move on to the Cortis A715, big numbers, 20% power reduction for the same performance, 5% uplift in performance at the same power. And again, they've done that by making changes to the micro architecture. Now, one thing about the 715 that is worth mentioning is that the 7110 was actually a 64-bit and 32-bit process. It could run AArch 32-bit programs. The Cortis X2 could not run 32-bit. It was always 64-bit. The Cortex A510 was 64-bit. We'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. But the 7110 was there to maintain kind of 32-bit uh, compatibility. If you remember, I've got a video here on this channel called 32 Bits is Dead. And then where I've talked about how ARM are now moving over to a 64-bit only uh, ecosystem. So the A715 is 64-bit only. So all of the 32-bit stuff that was there has been removed. And of course, that can help improve, therefore, the area size and also the layout that they have to create when they put those transistors down from the design that they've made. Now, one thing they've noticed here in the decoder is that all paths, all the decoders can handle all operations. So, of course, there are different types of instructions that come in. Not only do you have, you know, your normal kind of, you know, uh, add and subtract and compare, there are also NEON instructions and there are SVE and SVE2 instructions. Now, all of the decode paths can handle any instruction. So that improves the overall performance. And so the idea here is, if you look at this graph, is the A715 basically offers exactly the same power curve, uh, but you've got greater performance as you go along. So basically an increase in performance without actually sacrificing anything in terms of the power. As I said, the uh, A, A510 now supports a 5% decrease uh, in uh, power improvement, which means you can have a greater frequency, as I mentioned there. There are 12 cores available now. But one interesting side note is that the A510 can now also come in a 64-bit, 32-bit version. So the previous first generation of the A510 was 64-bit only. Now there is a 64-bit, 32-bit version. We're probably not going to see that in smartphones. That's more available for IoT and for other devices that want to be able to run 32-bit. I'm still expecting that in an Android smartphone, you're going to see the 64-bit only version of the A510. However, if in some markets, some processors wanted to maintain 32-bit capabilities for Android, for whatever reason, I don't know why they'd want to do that, but for whatever reason, they could use the uh, A510 just to give that compatibility. It won't be the performance, but you will have the compatibility. Okay, so that's it. Uh, two new processors and a refresh, Cortex X3 A715. As I said, this year, really, we are expecting the phone, the processors in our phone to be built on roughly the same processor, no, five nanometers, four nanometers, not much difference between them, just some tweaks there. So really, we're, we're looking at that 10% faster overall in the single threaded score, and then probably 5% due to the uh, A715. And then if you actually include that, uh, the X3 will be in there as well. We're maybe looking at a 6 or 7% boost in the multi-threaded scores. So at some point, maybe I'll make a video kind of doing some projections about what we're actually going to expect for kind of score-wise. But there we have it, the X3 and the A715. Now, I am also going to do a video probably about a week or so from now looking at what comes after the X3 because ARM did release a tiny little bit of information about what's coming next. But for this video, that was the X3, the A715. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you like these kind of videos, then please do stick around by subscribing to the channel. You can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains, and I also have a monthly newsletter. Go over to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, but you will get the email. Don't forget, I've got another video out about the GPUs. I hope you get a chance to see that. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.